Welcome to Raise 'em Rugged, the podcast for parents wishing to raise confident, adventurous, anti-fragile children who are ready to take on life's challenges. Let's get started. It's Dina, like Dina. D-E-E. Yep. You can just cross the A out if that helps you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dina Thayer, Future Focused Parenting. Thanks for joining me on thanks our Raise so much a for Rugged me. podcast. And I know all you care about is kids that are tough and never cry, right? <laughs> 100%. 100%. No, not exactly. You know, there's a little more to it than that, but a lot of, I'm excited to chat with you because I think there's going to be a lot of crossover and a lot of just points of alignment that hopefully will resonate with, with your audience. Yeah, great. So yeah, Raisin Rug is definitely not about that. It's not about kids that never cry, but it's kids that cry and then are able to process what's happening, deal with it, look at it and move on. So I think the the crying in a child is great as long as they're able to accept whatever it is and shortening that that time frame of how long you're upset, which actually is really good for an adult as well. It's something I've learned from Sam Harris. I listen to Sam Harris and his meditation app, and he talks about when you're really angry about something and uses road rage as an example. Are you going to let that ruin two hours, or does mm-hmm. a certain altercation warrant You've been angry for three days with the idea that the goal is constantly reducing that. So whatever it is you're facing that you're angry, upset about, that you can look at it, accept it, process it, and move on and reduce it to a small gap. Mm. But anyways, that's the sidebar. So introduce me to yourself and your podcast and your consulting and what all it is that you do. Yeah, so... As, as you said, I'm Dina Thayer. I'm based in the Pacific Northwest and really interested in the field of parenting starting as early as possible. In fact, I came into the parenting world via the birth world. So I've been a birth doula for 20 years and a childbirth educator and really loved setting up families for their parenting journey, but then was bothered by well, now what? We do all of this work with birth classes and you know preparing people for that day. And to be sure it's an important day, but there seems to be sometimes a disconnect into helping people move into the parenting journey side, which lasts frankly much longer, even mm-hmm. if you have a protracted labor. So that's what kind of sparked my interest in this. And wanted to really help people beyond that. So I first moved into helping families just in that early stage. And so I still do infant sleep consulting and early parent coaching, but I knew there was more there and was really grateful to connect with my podcast co-host Kira, who came to this world through mental health and is a hypnotherapist and works a ton with, with families and the emotional intelligence side and all of that. And so we were able to connect up and realize we had some shared philosophy around how to approach parenting. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit in the conversation. So together we founded Future Focused Parenting, which really is an organization that hopes to equip families to look at playing the long game, not how do I get this tantrum to stop right now, but who is the adult that I'm trying to raise? And then how does that inform how I respond to this tantrum right now? And it's been a really wonderful journey. We also have five seasons of a podcast called Raising Adults. For that exact reason, we were really bothered by the phrase raising children. That's not what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, I'd rather not have a 30-year-old child on my couch playing video games. So it's this shift of how do I get to the raising a fully responsible contributing member of society? And then how does that inform what I'm doing with this little person in front of me right now? And so our podcast, Raising Adults, is out there and we do the coaching work and it's been really wonderful. And then personally, I am married. I'm in a blended family, which adds a whole nother element to this being a biological parent and a step parent. And just some of the complexity that that's brought, I think, has actually lent some great experiences to my 
personal parenting experience in terms of just the different layers of things I've had to deal with and how I've had to adapt in that way. And we together have five kids and they're all on the older end. In fact, our youngest just graduated high school on Friday. So they are 18, 20, 20, 22, and 23. But uh, we've been in the thick of it with all five of them. We met when the youngest was seven. So we went through a lot of hormones and teen angst and all of that. And, and being able to kind of apply these future focused principles has been really interesting and also really gratifying as we're now seeing them enter this young adulthood phase. So that's a bit about me. So before we go on, has it worked? Great question. So because if it hasn't, then we shouldn't even bother talking. Yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I awesome. and and it, and it's not it's not in this pat yourself on the back. Yeah, yeah, way, yeah. But I do think in a way but you see the fruits adult, of what you've been trying to embed in them. That's right, and it's it's sort of as if in a business, you know, the product speaks for itself, mm -hmm. and the people that we're putting out in the world will say something about our parenting. I know we don't always want to believe that, <laughs> but it's true. And so far, we've got no one who didn't launch so i think that's a huge a huge thing right there because that's a big thing that we're seeing now a lot of boomerang and right. our our kids are on their own and three of the five are working and we have the second youngest in college and the baby about to go to college in the fall so it's been pretty gratifying to see they've had very different paths not all of them are the traditional four-year university we've had trade school direct entry to the workforce all the things yep. but they're functioning and contributing and taking care of their business and so I think it's largely been really great proof for this playing the long game and future focused mindset good because if if all your kids were living at home in the basement eating Cheetos and playing video games then you, you don't really you know, you're not selling me. No, I'm not going to have any. And I might change our yet. approach here too. Then, yeah, so maybe we should do the opposite. But. Right. Well, that's really cool. So, you do you, do you deal with a lot then of people in the blended family situation? Because this is such a common thing now compared to 30, 50 years ago. If you heard the term "step monster" before, I'm yeah. sure you 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 had to wear those shoes and navigate that, and that must be a real test for your. Your philosophies on parenting in a, in a different sort of way yeah it is a test because the truth is i could not parent my stepkids right away i right. didn't have the rapport with them so even Probably though i had all these to, ideas, they might not respond to it right like who are no, you 100 percent. And it, and it was more important to develop the relationship first to earn the place of authority you couldn't go in reverse order mm -hmm. and and that's something we talk to families about my husband and i actually facilitate a group for blended families and we talk through these kinds of things around step parenting and managing visitation and it, dealing with your ex-wife-in-law and you know all the all the other people because there's a lot of parents in the kids world too a lot of different voices and how you conduct yourself in the midst of that really matters in how they turn out. It really does. So yeah, it's absolute extra layer of challenge. Yeah, that could be so challenging. I'm thankful I'm not in that situation, but I have enough friends who have, have gone through it. And you know, if if one biological parent has a whole different philosophy on parenting than the other, and the kids split time between roofs, it's like navigating that. You you have a full time business model just on focusing on that purely on its own without the other side absolutely it's one of the biggest challenges for families is if those homes don't match and the truth is often they don't because that That's might have been part of why up. the marriage didn't yes exactly it's part of why they're not together anymore right if you don't agree on something as fundamental as how you're going to raise your family it's a huge it's a huge issue and so we've been a big advocate for what we call like the transition day the day they switch houses they really need a day to just recalibrate remember whose house they're at have a lot of grace for hey you don't remember that actually we don't jump on the couch here or whatever right. it is we use I'm utensils just, in this house <laughs> yeah giving them the transition time is really important they deserve grace it's a lot of work to switch i mean those of us in multiple environments of any kind you know you know how to act at work versus at home versus at this particular community and kids often don't have those same skills and yet they're being thrust into doing that essentially interacting in two different worlds and figuring out how that works and so they they need the time to switch gears 
Right. So you know that that leads in that that's a good segue into your pillars and your your three main principles because you talk of parenting from a strong why, which I I really like, and being clear on your family's personal values. So yeah. having a set of values, I, I am assuming this means a set of values that are individual to your family Correct. and what it is that you all sort of agree as like a code to live by. And I, I think I could see, I'll, I'll let you talk on that. And then the proactive approach and I have to get an understanding of what you mean by that. And I could see the family's personal value one sort of in our society with an absence, strong, organized religion that was able to, to bring that and have that sort of uh, ready to go and on the table for you, right? With, mm-hmm. with um, whether it's a good or bad for society, time will tell. But with organized religion falling by the wayside for a lot of good reasons, something to put in its place, right? Because I think nature and humanity abhors a vacuum. And I think a lot of it is in that realm. You know, if we don't have that in ready to go for us, then what is your, your rudder to keep you on the path? And whether that's as your family or, or maybe even a whole society. So I think that one really stood out to me about having that written down. So I'll let you um, explain about the, the three pillars a bit more. Sure. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, that rudder, that's a really good analogy. So I will spend a, a moment on those values and kind of what we're meaning by that, because you're right, there's been a shift just societally. And so getting back to a framework becomes really important. So we always emphasize starting with that strong why. And the reason that's our first pillar is the truth is the hows and what's of parenting are really hard. <laughs> that's just the reality. We're going to every one of us is going to get thrown a parenting curveball at some point. And when you have that strong why to go back to, it really informs the way you handle things. Celebrity personal trainer Jillian Michaels is kind of known for saying, if you have a strong enough why, you can tolerate any how. And I think in some ways that's never more true than in parenting. If your why is solid, you know what you're aiming at, you're more willing to do the work to get there. And that's exactly why the podcast is called Raising Adults. The why is who's the adult that you're trying to raise. And so what we recommend families try to do is narrow that down to just a few words or a short phrase. For me, my overarching why is raising people of integrity. So I'm looking for this strong moral compass. And my co-host, for example, Kira, hers is raising mentally and emotionally healthy and happy adults. So that's what she is aiming at. And it affects all her parenting decisions along the way. Is this going to help them be mentally healthy? Is this going to induce emotional health? That's what she's looking at. I'm always looking through the lens of character, integrity. Where are we at here? Is this going to help guide you? And that goes to the second pillar, because then when you're creating these values, they're going to be driven by the why. They're the things that get you to your overarching why. So you're exactly right. We used to essentially kind of have this done for us when everyone kind of believed the same thing, you know, a hundred years ago or, or longer. And now some people haven't put anything in its place and just kind of have no infrastructure or framework for how they're going to go about this. And the truth is, it is a bummer that we have to take tests to get a driver's license, tests to go to school, and anybody can be a parent. And we've got to have some kind of scaffolding around that. So that's where this comes in. Kira and I are kind of dorky. We actually made lists, but we encourage that. Sometimes having them visual is helpful. And you're right. The other thing I love that you pointed out, it's this is specific to each family. It's not like we're saying our values need to be yours. This family's values need to be theirs. It's you're going to sit down together with your parenting partner, if you have one, and talk about like, what are the things we're aiming at here that will get us to that, to that why. And we really encourage keeping it short, you know, maybe eight to 10 at the most and putting the definition there. So, you know, what does that mean for your family? So for instance, unsurprisingly, one of ours is integrity and we have under it, we stay and do the right thing in our family, even when no one is looking. So our kids would know what that meant. Like, oh, mommy and daddy aren't here, but I still have a choice to make. Or we had things like stewardship. We take good care of our belongings in our family. Again, that's a moral compass thing. Are you going to choose to make your bed when you're a grown up? Are you going to choose to clean up? When you're at someone else's house, 
Are you going to leave things how you found them and help them pick up after a play date? I mean, it informs so many things. So that's why the why comes first, because it will really inform the values that you create. And if you have pre-readers, you can put pictures on your values list and have them know what that looks like. An example of somebody picking up their toys or a little picture you cut out of a magazine, it doesn't matter. But those are really huge because like you said, they are the rudder. If you If you're just drifting in the waves to extend the analogy, the parenting journey is going to be way rougher than it even needs to be. And that's the other thing I love is parenting in this way, what you're talking about, what I'm talking about actually also enables you to enjoy it instead of just kind of white knuckle it right. and be struggling. So th those are the first two. Um, and then the final one, the take a proactive approach, really what we're talking about there, this goes to that future focused mindset. And that's whenever possible. And we know it isn't always, like I said, we're all going to get thrown curveballs, but whenever possible to make a plan and be parenting based on executing the plan rather than coming up with something in the moment. I call that whack-a-mole parenting. Like, oh, this cropped up, knock it down. This tantrum's happening, squish it instead of having a plan. And then you you know, we, we're just going to execute the plan. So that can go for everything from you've got a toddler and you can see potty training in your future. Great. Sit down with your spouse or partner and figure out how are we going to handle that in our house? Are we going to be the like, let them run around naked for a weekend and figure it out? Are we going to do something a little more structured? But you make that plan and then it doesn't catch you as off guard. And what's great, I can speak from experience having five, then you're not going, oh no, another one is turning this age. Now what? You know how you do it. You say, this is right. how we do it in our family when you've got that proactive approach. So I love that. We did that since we were a little further along with the blend. Our big one where we were first able to do this was with driving. When our first one turned 15, we talked about how are we handling driver's ed? Do we provide a car? Are they going to use a family car? Will we pay for gas? Will we pay for insurance? And what was so nice is we hammered all that out in advance each of our kids had a driving contract that they signed. And then the next one turned 15. We weren't like, oh, no, now what? Like, oh, we know how we do this. And that's really nice. I'll just quickly mention there is a second way to do this, though. And I think it's really powerful, especially with like early grade school. And you said you have six and nine. So this is a great time frame. My nephew's also six. And we were just with him last night is when you're coming in closer proximity to something, you still can do this prep. So an example I love is say going to a nice dinner at somebody's house to talk in the car on the way there about what the expectations are and hey let's talk through let's remember you know how do we ask for something at the table or how might you ask your host where the restroom is things like that it's so nice because not only is that helpful for you because you avoid something like a kid going hey i have to poop you know at the table yeah but they're more able to be successful. I mean, we have, we so often expect things of our kids when we haven't even communicated what the expectations are. So we're enabling them to be successful by saying, Hey, I'm going to let you know in advance what I'm looking for. And then they can do it. Kids surprise us all the time with what they can do. They can meet the expectations, but they deserve to know about them. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, I wasn't quite sure. So the proactive approach is sort of predetermining how you're going to handle so you can really apply it to sort of major milestones, whether it's driving or puberty or whatever it may be, or right up to smaller instances where there could be conflict or issue or something to deal with. I'm in small business. I've taken all sorts of courses, sales courses. What you're talking about there in a sales point of view is the upfront contract where you're letting the person know ahead of time what the expectation is at the outcome of that meeting. Exactly. Right? And it's, it's almost what you're doing with your kids. You're, you just have to let them know that we're going to do this thing and this is what we expect to happen. And this is how we expect you to behave and how I'll behave to you. And if we all do this, we're going to have a much better time. Yeah. You know, versus there again, going back to that, that ability to enjoy it then, then you can enjoy the dinner and you you're can not, enjoy it. Yeah. You're not stressed out about what they might say or do. And it's better for everyone and they're able to be successful too. And our kids deserve the ability to be successful. We, we can help them with that if we set the bar and, and communicate those things in advance. Exactly. You no, know, that really, I like this because it ties into a couple other things. I've, what started a lot of this, this idea in this podcast was reading Jonathan Haidt, Coddling of the American Mind. Uh. And he directed me to Lenore Skenazy, uh, Free Range Kids who was our, our first interview here. 
and okay. the concepts coming out of that. And I've listened to Jonathan Haidt and Warren Farrell interviewed with Jordan Peterson, psychologist talking about children. And one thing needing your children to do is they have to, you have to civilize them in a way that other people want to be around them and that right. adults yeah. want to be around them. Mm -hmm. And and what Peterson talks about is there's nothing worse you can do than allow your child to become someone that other people don't want to be around. You've you've basically hamstring them, you've crippled them from chances of future success, whatever that may be. And 100%. what you're talking about, this upfront contract idea, this sort of pre-establishing your proactive approach can really be used to to that. It's like, we want to make sure that you're someone that other people want to be around, that other kids want to play with, right? That adults can handle being around you because then adults will, and this is what he talks about a lot, adults will take you under their wing and show you and teach you things, even adults that aren't your own parents, if you become someone who's enjoyable to be around. Mm -hmm. And the advantages that that alone can give you in life can be extraordinary. But kids Absolutely. aren't naturally wired that way. Like they're, they're, they're little barbarians. I think it's um, uh, Thomas Sowell that uh, says children are little barbarians that need to be, be tamed and civilized. So people want to be around them. And I got two young boys. Yeah. They need <laughs> and I'm sure that I'm not sure I'm 100% positive. That was me as well. So <laughs> your thoughts on any of that? Yeah. I think this is a really great point because Kira and I talk a lot about the ways this actually benefits them as they navigate through the world later. And that's really a role we do not want to abdicate or just leave to chance. And I think sometimes parents, I, I don't, I, and I don't think this is on purpose or any, any kind of icky motivation, but I think unwittingly we can forget that we're also their first and best teacher. And there are a lot of things in life that they just don't know. And it's our job to teach them those things. And then the benefit of that has such a ripple effect over time as they grow. And like you said, being around children that know how to conduct themselves, even with things like looking someone in the eye or learning a handshake, we taught all our kids that, how do you greet somebody? It makes such a difference in how they're received and even the opportunities they'll have later because of that. And so taking that little bit of work on the front end is so worth it in the long term. You're going to see the fruit of that. And it's true. I can have my kids, even when they were small, we could, we could go to restaurants, we could go to concerts, we could do these things at venues where people would say, there's no way you can bring a kid that age. Well, you can, if they're taught again, what are the expectations? And we've role played and we've practiced and we've given them the tools to be successful. They can do it. And I think those are the kind of kids that become adults that other people want to be around. So I couldn't agree more. I think we have an important job to do in that shaping and teaching. And that does, we can't abdicate it to a school. We can't abdicate it to a community center or a sports team. The parent is the first, the first and foremost on that. We're the front lines. Yeah. So it sounds like you're talking about a combination of sort of some old school ideas hold your chin up sit up straight eat with your utensils like be a civilized person but then what you guys also bring to it is you know so you say if our parents or their parents would have wanted those exact same things but their tools to achieving it would have been not as intelligent maybe a stricter discipline or a if you don't you get your mouth washed out with soap or you get hit with a stick or who knows what you're looking for the same outcome but with more of a modern take on how to get to that goal on the mental health side, the emotional intelligence, the actual understanding the way, what level of development their brain is even at. And one yeah. thing I've noticed with our kids after reading this, it's very easy to give them instruction. And when they don't respond within two seconds, you start to get upset and you tell them again. And then you, you've told them three times and only 15 seconds has gone past. And then I learned that their brain actually might take five to 10 seconds to even process that sentence that you said to them. Right. So you've already said it three times and they, their brain hasn't even processed what you've said the first time. We probably didn't know this 15 years ago. 
No, I think, you know, to your point, even when we were chatting before we hit record, the idea of parenting as a skill set is even relatively new. There was not a parenting section of the bookstore 50 years ago. I mean, this just was not a thing. So we're really fortunate in that sense because we now know that we can do this well and that there are resources and people who can help inform that and give us the tools and skills we need. And at the same time, you're exactly right. It is a really twofold piece that's kind of, it feels like it might be a dichotomy, but it's not because there's some things we can learn from the past. For instance, Kira and I lament a lot about the courtesy going to the wayside. We're, you know, we're fans of courtesy and these ideas of simple etiquette and things like that, but you're absolutely right. I do think we've learned that the approach to getting there can look different and take our whole child into account, including their emotional and mental well-being. And it doesn't have to be this my way or the highway kids are seen and not heard thing. They are important people. We want to raise them well. And I think you can do both. You can respect that person that your child is becoming while teaching them these skills that are going to help them be pleasant to be around. We don't have to have this idea that it's one or the other. And I think that's the kind of the new thing with parenting is that it's both and it's not either or. I think we used to think it's strict or totally permissive. Yeah. And my co-host likes to say, I'm really, really strict, but I really care how my kids feel about it. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of this both, you know, we've got, we, we believe in boundaries and we believe those can be really positive. In fact, lack of boundaries is pretty stressful for children. If you've read any of the research on that. That being said, the way you lay down the boundary really matters. Yeah. And then I guess it's as they get older, and this comes into, say, uh, uh, some thoughts on risk taking and what you allow them to do and be exposed to. As they get older, um, literally those boundaries physically can start to expand as yeah. they've earned your trust and you have you know that they can handle certain things. So I, it's sort of a twofold, right? They need the boundaries to, to know what to live within because otherwise they, they don't like lack of structure and chaos because if they feel that uh, their parents and their house is chaotic, their little brains can't handle that. I think what they need most is to know that it's um, safe and protected and, and orderly, right? That's right? And as they grow and you've taught them skills on how to deal with whatever it may be, how to cope with certain things, if you don't start letting those boundaries expand, you will also hamper them, right? So exactly it's a little fine balance. They need right. boundaries, but when you yeah. keep the boundaries too tight, you're going to hurt them too, mm -hmm. right? If you don't give them independence and some freedom, the idea that kids from my generation in the you know late 70s, early 80s, at the age mine are at now, we were out playing, we were walking to school on our own, there was no parents around. That's pretty rare now, and it doesn't necessarily need to be. This is... Uh, Lenore's big topics in, in her book. And even Jonathan Haidt goes a little further. Haidt goes a little further to say that if you're not giving your child some independence by age of eight, as like to be able to go to a park by themselves with some friends, he would he would equate that as um, equivalent to child abuse. Like he'll take it a step further that you're hampering them so much if you don't start giving them independence before they're 10 years old. And that's a bit of an eye opener for me because I'm like, because as much as I talk about them, being independent and risk taking all this stuff, I still am hesitant of them doing it without us watching. You know, sure, sure. Even though they're at the and age it, that they should be, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, and to be fair, I think some of that does depend where you are. You know, if you're yeah. in a super urban area, you might have to make different choices than someone who's a little bit more rural. But that being said, I completely agree that the other piece of future focused parenting for us is watching for what is my child capable of? And as soon as they're ready, hand that off. Let them do it. The other thing that exhausts parents is we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing anymore. Right. And, and we have a lot of that as there's this more protective kind of helicopter parenting that you sometimes see. It's because they're doing things, frankly, their kids should be doing and are capable of doing. So we're all about, you know, offload what you can when you can let them show you that independence. And we talk about parenting in an inverted triangle, that when the kids are young, the boundaries are tight by virtue of their age and the experience that you as a parent bring to the table, but this should expand as they get older. And some parents unfortunately get that in reverse and they're kind of giving their toddlers like all this crazy freedom and then their kid gets older and they try to clamp down. Super frustrating for the child. 
and will create conflict for the kids. This is the, the myth I love to debunk is that you can enjoy the teenage years, but that's only if you've done the job down here when the boundaries needed to be tight and that you've loosened them as they get older, you can quite enjoy that time and move from this more um, authoritative role to more of becoming your child's peer. And it's really beautiful to watch. And I, having young adults, have seen that. And steered so, them through it. Yes, absolutely. But they know, I mean, in, in fact, one of our things in our house, we have no rules by 16 is the goal. So that they still have a few years while they're at home to practice making those mistakes where there's still a safe place to talk about it. So we don't have curfews. We don't do things like that. But if they stay up too late and miss something important the next morning or are tired when there was a test in chemistry, we talk about that. What do you think wasn't great about that? How might you do it differently next time? But they're given the freedom to make the mistake while there's the safety net of talking it through because the reverse of this is the overprotective parent and then the child suddenly doesn't has has no freedom essentially till they move out or go to college and then it's chaos yeah or they never grow out of it at all right and or are living in a bubble which is yeah. equally detrimental so you know i i kind of had no rules by 16 but i think it was because i was i was rebelling it wasn't it wasn't planned for me to have no rules right. by 16 i was just saying i have no rules now to a degree yeah. but i was right. never you know terrible but um so this ties into you're talking about this inverse pyramid your i do it we do it you do it mm -hmm. sort of template i love that yeah right? yeah that's so the that. i do it i guess is the i do it for you then we do yeah. it together and then you've handed it off so can you give a few examples for you know a nine-year-old a 12-year-old a four-year-old and that's really into um at what age can my child Yep. fill in the blank they seem you, to go together they do because we're often looking at that and i had mentioned that once you see the capability you want to do the handoff and this is the pr kind of a framework i came up with for the handoff so it can be for anything from you know a four-year-old learning to make their bed hey you know first i'm going to show you how i make your bed and i really encourage parents do it properly show them yes. if you if you like the hospital corners if you like the pillow in a sham show them the whole thing but let them really watch and then you spend the time on we do it okay now we're going to do it together and i'm not saying just once i agree with you we've got to also respect the frame of the child and there's some processing so some kids might get it in a day or two other families the we do it might be a whole week of making the bed as a team who cares if it's a week or a month who cares what you, you were going to do it is, yourself the whole time anyways right i mean that is far preferable to you still making their bed when they're 10 just because yeah. it's important to you right so however long that takes, when you can see that they're capable of doing it, not just doing it, but doing it to your expectations, you hand it off. Guess what? Now you get to do it. And the cool thing with this is this also really changes the perspective through which or the lens through which kids view the task, because now it feels like a privilege. I've earned it. Now I get to do it. Not, oh, another thing I have to do. So it's amazing the buy-in you get as well by going through this. And so that's, you know, maybe an example with a younger kid would be maybe teaching a chore. But we did this for everything from making lunches, you know, first I did it and then eventually I would set out the items, but they packed the lunch box. Oh, I like and, it. We're probably at that stage now where we should be. Yeah, it was, and it was great. And they knew the things we wanted to include. Like we had our main course, you have to have produce, you have to, sure. and they would, and they would learn where that was. And so many from each bucket. Right. Yeah, yeah like we it. had little baskets in the pantry and they knew to pick and then I was out by third grade. So they made their own lunches starting in third grade, uh, including, you know, a sandwich or whatever the main course was. And then we also did this for laundry. So at age eight, it was a lot of observing. And then I was still washing, drying, folding, but they would put away at age nine. They went to folding and putting it away. And age 10, I was out. Awesome. So it was awesome. And so and you can do that even for older kids, things like, you know, slowly learning how to handle your own time schedule that's a big one kids are so busy now in the world and they got activities and sports and school Too and that much. time management thing is sometimes they need some support on that so do it together learn how to write things down or use your phone app to get get your calendar in order and then eventually you got to hand that off and if something gets missed or they make a mistake they're again a safe environment to talk about that and work on it but they've got to practice we can't just prevent all the mistakes by always reminding you know you have that thing today when they're 17 yeah. you know yeah yeah because I, I have a feeling kids respond better when you talk about making the bed and really showing them how and then or whatever that chore might be that you're handing off but then when they've done it successfully like you make a big deal out of it 
Yes. Like a big celebration. You almost can't go overboard. And if they're young, you can be crazy, jump around, shout high fives. There, yeah. I've seen my kids glow and their eyes light up and it was making the bed, you know, but yeah. to them, you make a big deal out of it. And then they're excited to do it again. And because they love that praise, right? They love attention. Yeah. A lot of reason that kids, my understanding, and you would know much more about this, a lot of misbehavior is due to lack of attention. They want intention and intensity. This is from mm -hmm. Kirk Martin. If you know of him from uh, Celebrate Calm, we've had him on, on here. Mm -hmm. It's like some of these kids, they want intensity. They, they like things are intense. So when things are calm, they're going to start picking on their sibling or whoever it is, yeah. right? So if you can create that intensity, even through the celebration of something that's been done right, then to me, that's, that's really cool. You know, yeah, and, and, and the let sense them of see that accomplishment for them is huge. Yeah. I mean, the pride and yeah. they they can feel I'm really capable. And that breeds that confidence to tackle the next thing that they're gonna try in the world, whatever it is. Rather than it always being a, go do this, go do that, yeah. go do this. Exactly. And then you know, that's that's they're gonna do it out of um, fear of repercussion rather than craving the celebration or that they know they've mm -hmm. done something they're meant to do, right? Yes, yes. And then there is a really neat step beyond that though, because what, what we also love about this is then that sense of accomplishment and capability breeds repetition into other areas of life where now, you know, maybe at first I was doing it for the accolades and it was mm. great to hear my parents celebrate this achievement, but now I grow past even needing the celebration because I know I'm capable and it gives me the confidence to go, you know, I can try this new thing. Or if my parents give me this new task, you know what, I'm going to learn it willingly because I know they're going to positively affirm me when I get it right but moving past where that's the need. So I think you have to start there, but what we want to develop is where I will do it even without that because I know yeah. I'm capable and strong. And, but, but you're right. I think, especially on the front end, you really kind of can't overdo the accolades and the positive affirmation. We've got to point out when our kids are getting it right too much of the time. I think we can sometimes overcorrect on the side of correction and fall in the ditch on it's easy to find oh they still need to work on that or why hasn't this happened yet or i said this 33 times today but to catch them doing it right is huge and i do it we do it you do it is just like a built-in opportunity for that when you do the handoff yeah celebrate it you yeah, know that's a that's a tough one it's not a tough one it's a tough one to remember to yes. celebrate the things they've done right because you're always just correcting correcting giving direction, correcting, giving direction. And, you know, that's a, that's a management tool as well, right? It's easy if you're managing people always point out the things being done wrong and not celebrate the things being done right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's human nature because the things being done wrong are what need focus and attention to improve the system or the next day or the household. But right. if you're not celebrate the things being done right, you're likely to just fall into the same trap of them always not being done right. But I yeah. see that with kids because I think of our interactions with them and so much is just correcting and disciplining, correcting and disciplining. It's like, man, if that's their whole world, that would suck. It would. I, I don't want, like, I don't like that. And it's probably not fun for them. Not so much, no. Right? How can it be? No. You know, and it's vocabulary. all they know, so they don't even know it's not fun. They just think that's their world. Yeah, it's just, yeah, they have nothing, they have no frame of reference, right? So they don't, they don't know any different. But I think that's where vocabulary is really huge, too. I mean, we really encourage families, even when you have to give a correction, is there a way to frame it positively? So staying away from no and don't, unless it's danger. I really, I always encourage my coaching clients, save your no for like the hand about to go on the stove, save your stop for a kid about to run into the street. Cause then they know you mean it. If they don't hear it regularly, if they're always hearing, no, don't stop. It starts to become like the Charlie Brown. Womp, womp, Nothing. Womp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't even mean anything. So we talk about things like, can you change? Don't run to, hey, remember we use our walking feet in the house. Frame it positively, talk about what you do wanna see. And the other thing is you're not planting the idea of what you don't wanna see. Don't hit is very different than, I'd like you to touch your sister gently. Right. Uh, let's talk about what we do wanna see. And I'm gonna save the no, don't stop for when there's actual danger because it is my job to keep you safe. And I think then their ears perk up to that differently because they're not hearing it all the time. Oh, another no, another don't touch it, another, you know, just because They just background. zone out. And then you get upset because they zoned out yeah, right. and you say it four more times. They haven't processed the first one. Yeah. Right. And then every day vicious can become cycle. like that. And that's not fun. No, vicious really, cycle. There's these tools, they sound like 
it all makes sense to me. I think to a lot of people saying, oh, they're just kids. They should just listen. It's like, well, that's how we were all brought up, I guess, right? Like kids are meant to be seen, not heard, that idea. And it's like, yeah. what what did that really do? Accomplish. Yeah. What did that accomplish? Where did that lead all of us? Did that make all of us, you know, emotionally stable, emotionally intelligent adults? You know, I don't think so. And we talked about this briefly before we started recording. I've talked to some friends about this recently. And I think this idea that, you know, parenting has shifted from, you know, you know, say my grandmother was born in like 1917, you know, First World War, Great Depression, married and having kids around Second World War, raising kids post-war time with uh, men coming back from Europe that had all sorts of issues after seeing what they saw and losing all the people they knew, had no clue any of this type of stuff. And right. I think even to this, I don't know if we're in roughly the same demographic, I'm, I'm pushing my late 40s. And I don't think parents up until maybe this point, if not maybe a little bit sooner, maybe are able to realize that, you know, and realize that this is what's led to the way that we parent is basically, to me, it starts at the turn of the century, because the, the whole story of the 1900s is, is coming through that. And you talk about overcoming past traumas. I think our families are still overcoming the past traumas of leading right back through World War II, through the Depression, through World War I. And it's still rippling down through the way we've been parented and passed along generationally, right? But now it's maybe a time that we, and conversations like this and what you are doing, is you pop your head up and go, oh, wow, that's what led to this and who we are and how we react to things. And we can do way better. It's not that it's hard. It just you have to fall out of your habits that have been handed off to you. It's like you have to fall out of those or intentionally fall out of those. And some people, I think, have a hard time with it. It's wishy-washy. It's soft. It's whatever it is. But if the outcome, I will come back to your principles, are to get to that adult that you're trying to raise, will they become a better adult which is your end goal your biggest project you will ever have in your life do you want to succeed at it or not you know will this give a better result than if yeah sorry for rambling but i think um no, it important. all ties in really well it does and we've got to be aware of those family of origin things that we carry there might be some things that our parents or grandparents did that we want to emulate but of i course. think we also often find there's some things we for sure do not want to replicate and we can do differently and we can do better. And I, I think that's the key to that duality you were talking about earlier is having more emotional intelligence, not being the stoic, I just got home from the war, I need a beer, I'm not going to talk about my feelings. To get away from stoicism doesn't mean over permissiveness. That's why I was talking about holding the both and. We can have polite, responsible adults who also know how to process big feelings and to deal with pain that comes their way. And we've talked about, you know, the word resilience. And I think it's a myth as well that resilience just means a bounce back without any processing in between. True resilience is, you know, I felt the trauma of that event or the pain of that event, but I had the tools to process that and move through. That's true resilience. Yes. It's not a quick bounce back. Oh, I look, I might look like I'm fine, but I have trauma. So that this is all so important and it can be done. I think that both and is important. You can have really great adults out in the world who were raised by parents who cared about this stuff and approached it with heart and looking at the whole person. Yeah, I think learning from the past generations definitely they're sort of they had grit and resilience in a different way mm -hmm. which I, I think is is needed and yes. part of my fear and one of the whys i suppose with with our boys is that there's no saying that times as hard as what occurred 100 years ago won't happen again and how do you have children who become adults whatever age that may happen at or never happen that will be able to handle that if mm -hmm. things got to the point that they were 100 years ago, Great Depression, war, like we don't know. This level of stability in society that North America has felt since the 50s till now is completely abnormal throughout all of human history. This is not the norm. This is, this mm -hmm. is freak. And 
it would be nice to think that that's this the evolution of human society and this is the way things will continue forever but it's not the norm and i've always thought like you know what would it take to have kids that if things got to be something that became really bad how would they be the ones that could get through it and lead others to get through it and it, it's also it's not just that grit that i can push through anything and hide everything but it's also accepting acknowledging embracing and being able to rise above and just say okay yep yeah, that's where we are and now i need to do a b c and d and just move on and i worry that this is one of one of the reasoning things behind this i think is that if kids are given everything you know and they're never given the i do it we do it you do it they're not taught some real skills getting your hands dirty they're not you're not that you're going to put them through hard times but you don't get out with them in bad weather you don't make them carry their own backpack you don't do anything challenging if life got challenging which it could you haven't helped them no no they're not equipped with the skills to deal with that and that's why i think we need to have respect for the grit and toughness of the generations of right. the past while not copying how that was dealt with exactly and and so there's a way to take what's good from that but not bring along what was what was not so great right yeah and i think they you know, they had way more kids and maybe yeah. it was just that's the way you just you know if i had well you've had five in your house so and you've proved it otherwise but i thought if i have nine kids in my house you know i wouldn't take the time i do with these two now it might be more the big stick approach you know <laughs> you, you just had to have i think of my grandmother who had uh and my brother had eight brothers and two uh, there was say ten of them give or take nine or ten of them and she ran the house with an iron fist you know I'm like well i probably would have too if i had 10 kids in the house but maybe not you just don't have the you, you how could you have as much i lose patience with two i can't even imagine having nine yeah well and you can't know a situation that you're not in you know yeah. we don't know what we would have done in that in that scenario so you hope that the principles would extrapolate out and you would you would do it but we don't know and that's fair yeah yeah interesting it was i don't want to keep you too long i try to keep these to 45 minutes to an hour or so what do you say to wrap up how would you wrap up? What's your, 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 your biggest nugget you would share for parents dealing with yeah. the challenges and children? Well, the, the thing I would go back to is even if you didn't hear any of the rest of it, if, if parents can even take the time to get, get around the idea of a strong why, it makes a big difference. Why are you even doing what you're doing? Why are you refereeing the 17th sibling fight today? Why are you teaching your child to spread peanut butter on their sandwich why are you getting them outside and believing that's important if you can look at why you're doing what you're doing it makes continuing to do it a little bit easier now notice i didn't say easy i'm i'm under no illusions that parenting is easy i've done it <laughs> but i do think making those decisions that are best not just the ones that seem easy or expedient in the moment comes with a strong why so all the way back to the beginning of our conversation it's easier to not just squash the tantrum what do i do to make it stop and to actually get on their level and figure out what's going on and separate feelings from behavior like hey it's okay that you're angry it's not okay that you hit me you know taking the time to do that if it's usually because you've got the why you know what i want an adult who can move through these big feelings successfully and interact with people and have positive relationships if nothing else sticks from today i would say that is the big key get clear on your why and then let it inform how you go forward awesome and people find you a website which was futurefocusedparenting.com that's correct. That's and where they, people can kind of learn about the parent coaching, learn a little bit more about me and Kira and just the philosophy of future focused parenting. Our podcast, Raising Adults, is on all major platforms. You can find it and you can also listen on the website if that's what's easier for you. And then we're also on both Facebook and Instagram and our handle is at Future Focused Parenting. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's been a fun yes. conversation. Maybe we'll check in six months or a year down the road and see where we're at. Thanks again for having me. Awesome. Enjoy your day. Thanks. You too. Thanks for listening to the Raise em Rugged podcast. We'll see you again next time as we continue on this parenting journey. Be sure to like, subscribe, download, and rate the show. 
You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media outlets. 